Well, good morning, church. Now, that's what I'm talking about. Thank you. This is a community. You aren't here to be entertained. This is not a stage. You are not the audience. We are the worshippers of God. And this morning, you and I are here to give ourselves, relinquish our wills, to give ourselves to God and to tell him how much we love him. Do you love God this morning? Yes. That's, that's why you're here. That's why we're here. And we're doing it together because worshipping God in community is an essential part of being a Christ follower. We've got a couple of new people and visitors today, so that's really, really wonderful. Um, so, and, and we're also going to be hearing from Jesus today as he prays and teaches us about some of the core beliefs that we have. The reason we believe what we believe is partly because of the prayer that Jesus prayed today and, and the conversation that Jesus had with the people around him today. So pay attention when you hear the words of Jesus today. So having said all of that, um, and by the way, where are we? This is the last Sunday for the sermons in John for over a month. Next Sunday is the last Sunday of the ecclesiastical year. That'll be Christ the King Sunday and it'll be a healing service. The whole service is giving, given over to healing prayer. So heads up for that. And then we start the season of Advent and prepare for Christmas. And so the next sermon you hear from John won't be till in the new year, Lord willing. So having said that, this is the last time we're in John for this year. Are you ready for church? Church. Yeah. Yes, would you please stand? I was thinking about this this week, this, this greeting that we say, when, when I say to you the grace and the love and the fellowship, these aren't just phrases that we use. These are words that God uses to describe our relationship with each other. These are very precious phrases. Phrases, words. So I say to you, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Now, for some reason, I edited out the call to worship today, which is Psalm chapter 6 and verse 4. But John's going to read it for us anyway. Let's listen to the call to worship. Turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. So just think about this. Turn, Lord. Can I get your attention, please? Please save me. Now, look, we don't need a martyr. We don't need a guru. We don't need a prophet. We don't need a good guy. You and I need a saviour. The world needs a saviour, not an alternative. A saviour. Please, God, would you save me? And why would he save you and me? Because of his unfailing love. Your friends may not love you unconditionally. Your family probably doesn't love you unconditionally. But God loves you no matter what you do. And he's the only one who can save us. So when you ask God to turn and save me, that's because you need a saviour. Amen? Amen? Oh boy, I, I need a saviour. And he's the only one who can do it. So you're going to hear that theme all the way through the service today. So let's remain standing and we'll sing.
eternity. I'll praise the one who died for me. Do you realize what the Lord has done for you? Even if you've lived, you know, you were raised in a good family, you've tried to live a good life, that is uh, why the Savior came, that we cannot be good enough for to enter the glory and the presence of a holy God. The Lord has sent us our Savior. The Lord has sent us a Savior. This week, I asked the Lord for a specific word. Um, you know, I had done that like the night before I got this. I, and I sat down in the morning in a beautiful sunny room and opened my Bible. And it fell to Second Chronicles chapter 20. And I was reading about how these people were coming against Judah and King Jehoshaphat. And he was like, Lord, help, Lord, help. And then the spirit of the Lord came on one of the ones, which is a descendant of, uh, it was a, a, a descendant of a Levite. Um, and then this whole message came. But the part that really struck me was, it says, the battle is not yours. It's God's. And I was like, oh, okay. That's, there's a, a little bit of, there's a lot of encouragement, but a little bit of a, hey, you need to humble yourself. It's his battle. And I was thinking of Oikos as, as well. 20 minutes after I got that scripture, I opened my emails and there was a letter from Vicky, an email. And she was just sharing something that had encouraged her from Second Chronicles chapter 20, the exact same verse, verse 15. The battle is not yours, it's God's. So I was very encouraged. It, it was sent to her. And that was the day before I got it from the Lord. So it's like the Lord saying, yes, this is my word to you. So I want you to receive that for where you are. This is the word for you. The battle is not yours. So don't take on God's position. The battle is not yours. It's God's. And he is our best advocate. The Lord Jesus is our intercessor. He's interceding. He's praying with great passion before the throne of grace and for us. So let's sing before the throne of God. I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest, that's Jesus, whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me.
to welcome our visitors here today. So let's uh, go down and uh, see. Well, our, he's not even an out of town cousin. He's like a brother who just doesn't get here every Sunday anymore. But it's, it's Carolyn's son, Bill, or Bill's mother, Carolyn. They're both here. So let's welcome Bill Halliday back to us again. It's good to see you. And please do send our love to Heidi when you speak to her next. Great. Thank you. Um, now, in this next row up here, we've got a lot of news to tell you about. Let me start on this side here. I've been um, given a notification that Joy Lynn... That's you, Joy Lynn. She has sold all her chocolates. And they've sold out of chocolates. And now there's no more to be sold. There's no more to be sold. And um, next week we'll tell you about the concert that Joy Lynn's been raising money for in her choir. And um, you'll hear about that. So that's really good news. All the money's been raised and the chocolates have been sold out. That's probably good for some of us who are eating way too much chocolate. Um, but, and the other good news in that pew is that John and Merrily are back here with us. So, um, all doing well and healthy. So, praise the Lord. Welcome back. It's great. Now, let's go down. Okay, so here's a miracle. Sitting in the back pew, um, last week I introduced you to K.R., and I'm not going to tell you what his letters stand for, because I can't remember now. But <laughs> KR, that's how he goes. It's a miracle when someone comes to church to visit. It's a greater miracle if they come back a second time after listening to me preach. And it's a huger miracle if they bring somebody along. And so, KR, seeing this is your second time, would you introduce the person you've brought with you today? Let's welcome Darlene, everybody. Great to have you, Darlene. Now we have two Darlene's, so we've already uh, decided we're going to have first and second Darlene. So that's really great. Welcome to you. It's good to have you. Um, and uh, lots of people travelling at the moment, some people not doing well either, so we continue to pray for all of those who are not available or able to get to church. But we um, thank God that you're here today. So what a wonderful blessing. Um, joy time. Are we going to no joy time sitting in the service today? Great. You learned some good doctrine today, Joy Lynn. So when you become our youth pastor and then senior pastor and then bishop, uh, who knows where this is all going to go. But we're walking with you, Joy Lynn. Okay, we're last reading. We're at John chapter 12. And um, last reading for John for this year. Uh, you, know the, you know the tradition. When we read from the biography of Jesus, from the Gospels, we always stand out of a sign of respect. So I'm going to ask you to please stand as John reads to us. The Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 27 to 36. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it and said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. 
He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, "You are going to have the light." Just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. When we, when he had finished speaking. Jesus left and hid himself from them. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay. Before I preach, I'm going to ask one of you to lead us in a prayer as we study the text together. Would one of you please pray for us? We're in the last week in the life of Jesus. Okay, you help me with the context. Where are we in this last week? Where is Jesus right now? In Jerusalem. And um, who is he talking to? He's talking to the crowd. He's talking to the followers, but more specifically. He's talking to the Greeks. What are Greeks doing at the Jewish festival of Passover? They're God fearers. They're God fearers. They are Greeks who have understood the Jewish message and are following the Jewish teachings and traditions, and they're at the temple. And how does how is it that Jesus is speaking to the Greeks? How did that come about? Because they came and they wanted to meet him. They wanted a meeting. You can see the triumphal entry, Jesus entering from Bethany with millions of people and he's on a little colt and of a donkey and the Greeks wanted to meet him. How did the Greeks get to Jesus? Through Philip. Why did they ask Philip? Because he's got a Greek name. So you obviously go to someone who's Greek. Philip, how did, what did Philip do? He went to Andrew. And Philip and Andrew went to Jesus and said, Jesus, there's some Greeks here. And so the conversation with the Greeks began. Last week, we read that Jesus was talking to the Greeks. And we read um, that... You know, um, if you love your life and you want to follow him, you've got to lose it. He made it really, really clear. So now Jesus continues in this conversation, this discussion with the crowd who've joined him, the Greeks, the disciples. And Jesus tells us five amazing truths today that are some of the basic doctrines of the church. So from what Jesus teaches us, we learn some of the truths that the church has taught for years. And so I've entitled my sermon today, A Great Revelation, because the truths that Jesus reveals to us today are a revelation from him. People don't think this up. 
The Jews couldn't work this out on their own. This had to be revealed to them by the living God. So let's have a look at the text. First of all, a great doctrine, verses 27 and 28. Jesus says, Now, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Interestingly, if you have the old NIV translation, it says my heart is troubled. Anybody got that translation? Ah, that's really not healthy. <laughs> that's a bad translation. The Greek word is soul. My soul is troubled. Now, in the old English, heart and soul are uh, mixed together. But my soul is troubled. That's really important that we get that. Jesus says, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. <clears throat> I came for this very reason. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice from heaven I have glorified it and will glorify it again. So let's go back to this phrase, my soul is troubled. Your turn. Why is Jesus' soul troubled? He's going to die. He's going to be crucified, terrible. Why is his soul troubled? They haven't got who he is. And, and the end of the end of the line is coming. His time has come. So it's his now time. Or now, now or never. Why is his soul troubled? They're a sheep without a shepherd. He's human part. His human part, yeah. Like he's the, he's human, right? He. Why is his soul troubled? He knows that he's going to be separated from God. He doesn't want to die. He doesn't want to die. Uh, Arnie, what did you say? He knows that he's going to be separated from God. He's going to be separated from God. We often hear this verse quoted, my soul is troubled, but I want to help you understand what this actually truly means today. Is Jesus upset because of his imminent painful death? Is he in anguish because he's going to be crucified? Is he disturbed because he's leaving his family and his disciples? Possibly these are the words of a martyr who is going to be led to the slaughter. Maybe these are the words of a man who's giving his life for his friends, a self-sacrifice. Maybe he's like one of the Indian gurus who's giving his life up for the cause. This is a very difficult phrase to explain. My soul is troubled. It's a very difficult phrase to explain unless you understand an ancient doctrine of the church. It's the doctrine which I've taught you on many occasions of substitutionary atonement. It's none of the above. He's a martyr. He's a self-sacrifice. He's dying for the cause. No, it's much more than that. And our good friend Bishop Ryle, who helped me a lot this week, because I was way over my depth this week, and thanks to the uh, 20th century Bishop of Liverpool who wrote a commentary who helped me in this. Bishop Ryle says, it was the weight of the world's imputed sin laid upon our Lord's head which pressed him downward and made him cry, now my soul is troubled. Jesus was beginning to feel the weight of all the sin of the world on his shoulders. There are lots of martyrs who have died and never said anything in their death. But Jesus was in the process now of carrying all the sin of the world on his shoulders, your sin and my sin and everybody who's ever lived and everybody who will ever live. The sin of the world. That's why Paul wrote in Galatians 3, verse 13, if you're taking notes, 
Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. That's a quote from Deuteronomy, the law of Deuteronomy. Paul writes again in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him, that is Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's a substitution. Our sin was put onto him. We had all the sin, he had no sin. It's a substitution. And Jesus was beginning to see and feel the weight of all the sin of the whole world on him. No human being can imagine what that's like. Now we know at some point that substitution was completed. Does anybody know when that was? When was the substitutionary atonement completed? When the curtain was turned toward Yes, and what else happened just before that? He died and he said? It is finished. What do you think he was referring to when he said it is finished? The substitutionary atonement has finished. From now till the time he cries out, it is finished, Jesus was carrying all the sin of the whole world on his, soul, on his shoulders. That's the best way to explain my soul is troubled. Yeah, it's finished. So in this troubled soul of Jesus, we're learning these great doctrines of the church. The doctrine of substitution. That's what the church has taught for 2,000 years. He took our place on judgment. He was absolutely sinless and we were absolutely sinful. For us to be forgiven, he had to take our sins, put him on himself. He paid the penalty for sinlessness, for sinfulness, so that we wouldn't have to pay the penalty. It was a substitution. We also learned the doctrine of imputation. The doctrine of imputation. God took all the sins of us and imputed them onto Jesus. Jesus wore all our sins. They were imputed onto him. So that he is seen, in a spiritual theological world, he is seen as completely sinful and we are seen as righteous. Righteous. How can you and I be righteous? Now, I know you're probably good living people, but I struggle with sin every day. Say again. What what do you mean? Yes. Yeah, imputed means that God t- took this and put it here. But did he also take the righteousness and put it there? Well, he didn't need to because now that we had no sin, we're, we're righteous. Oh, okay. Okay. You see, we were dirty, if you want to use that phrase. And he took it and took it on himself, left us clean. Yeah. Now we're righteous. Yeah. And then the third phrase you want to follow from imputed. So... Substitution, imputation, imputed, and the third one is the doctrine of the atonement. The atonement. The price 
that God required for sin was completely paid for. Everything that God required for someone to become righteous was paid for by Jesus. He atoned completely for our sins. In other words, God said that death has to be paid for sin. The wages of sin is death. Death has to be paid for in order to get righteousness. So when Jesus died, he atoned for us, means he satisfied God's requirements for sin, therefore we we could become righteous. See, if Jesus, if God imputed all our sin onto Jesus and that wasn't enough for God, we still wouldn't be righteous. If God imputed all the sin onto Jesus and Jesus never died, we wouldn't be righteous because God required sinfulness and death for our righteousness. So whatever Jesus did, he paid the price that God required to bring righteousness. He, he atoned, he paid the full price for our sinfulness. So right there in Jerusalem, Jesus is talking to the Greeks and all of this stuff is going on. They had no idea. A substitutionary atonement with the imputation of sin onto him. Matthew Poole, he's even earlier than Bishop Ryle, 17th century theologian, his troubles were for the wrath of God due to us for our sins. His troubles, Jesus' troubles, were for the wrath of God due to us for our sins. We were supposed to get that, not Jesus. You and I were supposed to die in our sins for eternity. But Jesus took that on himself so that you and I wouldn't have to die. Jesus bore the sins of the whole world. That's why his soul was troubled. And every sin you've ever committed, and every sin you will ever commit, and every sin your children will commit, and your grandchildren, and all the people till Jesus returns, every sin of the whole universe was put on his shoulders. It's almost impossible to imagine a finite man carrying the sins of the world. And you know, if you're a sinful person, the wages of that sin is death. And that's what, was it Arnie, did you mention that he was separated from God? That's what the sin did. The Godhead was separated from itself. Now, don't try and understand that. You, you're, you and I are a finite beings trying to understand infinite concepts. But we can understand that. The the physical suffering that Jesus was to undergo was nothing compared to the immeasurable suffering he was going to experience by the weight of sin on him. Crucifixion was nothing compared to the weight of sin of the whole world. That's why his soul was troubled. So here's my first sentence under a great doctrine. Jesus bore our sin so that we would not... You can fill this part in. Jesus bore our sin so that we would not have to die eternally. Jesus bore our sin so that we would not have to die eternally. He was able to bring us salvation because our sin was imputed onto him. Righteousness was substituted and he paid God's price. He atoned for our sins. He paid everything that God required for sinfulness. 
I wrote that he wouldn't have to suffer, we would not have to suffer spiritual death. Though. Right. Yeah. We would not have to suffer spiritual death. Now we come to the second point, a great mystery. Jesus said, verse 27 again, what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. God, do you want me to save? Should, you, should, I, should I pray, God, would you please save me from my suffering? No. There's a whole purpose he came. Now, this is not politically correct. It's not culturally correct, but is theologically correct. It was God's will for Jesus to suffer. Now, you know where I'm going to go with this, don't you? Save me. God, please save me from my suffering. No. Nope. I came for this reason. What I should be praying is not, please save me from my suffering. No. What I should be praying is what? What does the text tell you? Verse 28. What does the text say? What does, what, what does Jesus say we should be saying? Glorify your name. In my suffering, I want you to be glorified. Not stop me from suffering, please. He was struggling with the sin that was thrust upon him. He committed no sin. His, all our sins were put on him and he was suffering under the weight of sin. He was a perfect man weighed down with sin. And yet he was holy God at the same time in human form. This is what John says in his letter uh, 1 John 3, 5. But you know that he appeared, so Jesus appeared, so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin, but on him is the sin of the world. Wow. Here's the mystery. God was suffering. <laughs> now, Jesus was suffering. His human side, he didn't want to suffer. Hands up those who can't wait to suffer. Nah. His spiritual side knew that he had to suffer for the sake of the whole world. In other words, catch this paradox. Holy God is suffering. That's a paradox. Right? Man has a free will. God is totally sovereign. That's a paradox. Jesus is fully human and he's fully God. That's a paradox. Good theology embraces paradox. His human side didn't want to die, but he came into the world for the whole purpose to suffer. But did Jesus ask God to take away his suffering? No, he didn't. Rather, he asked that God would be glorified through his suffering. Whatever would bring glory to God the Father is, was exactly what Jesus wanted, no matter what the cost. Here's our good friend Bishop Ryle again, if you'll allow me. Let us learn from our Lord's example that there is nothing sinful in praying to be delivered from our suffering. So long as we do it in submission to the will of God. <laughs> Did you hear that? Let us learn from our Lord's example that there is nothing sinful in praying to be delivered from our suffering so long as we do it in the submission to the will of God. Could it possibly be that some parts of your life, not everything, but some parts of your life in your suffering brought glory to God and reshaped you into more of his image. Is that a possibility? Is it possible that without suffering, you wouldn't be more like Jesus? You get the picture here, right? 
Here's another great mystery that God suffered and in his suffering, God was glorified. Now watch this. In some of your suffering is because of the results of your sinful nature and the consequences of your sin. God can use that. But some of your suffering is because you live in a broken world. And God will use your suffering to reshape you and bring him the glory. And Jesus taught us, don't you be praying, take it away from me. No, we should be praying, whatever I'm going through, God, may you be glorified in this. This is about him, not me or you. That's a hard lesson. It's a hard lesson. But if you understand this mystery, the, the doctrine of this conflict of God suffering, then you can understand how to deal with your own suffering. And I'll quote it again. I quote this all the time. But, you know, I wrote my thesis on a lady named Simone Weil. She was a mystic who died in the Second World War, a Roman Catholic lady. Uh, she's a French lady. Uh, and she uh, wrote in French, but a lot's been translated into English. And I, during my thesis, I, I read everything in, um, that she wrote in, it, it translated into English. And it so happened that her books were all in the lowest levels of the Sedgwick Library at UBC. I would spend a whole year down there. I never saw a person. I'm pretty sure mushrooms grew down there because it was pretty dark. Going down the stairs, the bottom stairs, to where the Simone Weil writings were. I wrote my thesis on her, Suffering and Affliction. And she said this, The extreme great greatness of Christianity lies not in the fact that it has a supernatural remedy for suffering, but that it has a supernatural use for suffering. Did you hear that? The extreme greatness of Christianity lies not in the fact that it has a supernatural remedy for suffering, it can fix all your sufferings, but that it has a supernatural use for suffering. God can use your suffering to do stuff to change you, to bring him glory and honour. That's a very powerful thing. Camille. Uh, Peter, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact of his humanity. Because in the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked very specifically, if possible, remove this cup from me, but not my will, but your will. Yes. So it's a submission, but he was human to the extent that this is too big. Yes. This is too painful. Can you remove it? Yes. And, that's the, and the point was, not my will but your will, anything for the glory of God. So this idea that I'm going through suffering and I want you to remove it, please God, please. Right? But there's a caveat there. We want to do it within the will of your, your will. Does God want everybody to suffer? No. He would pref prefer to have the world with no sin. You've got to get to the other world for that to be. But while we live in a world of sin and brokenness where every human, 95% of all human beings are broken and the other 5% are? Liars. Liars. You got it. While we live in a broken world, God can use this stuff. He can use your suffering. Please, God, take this suffering away from me. But there is a caveat there. And that's how Jesus taught us. He says here, should I take this... Should I pray that God will take it away? No. I should pray that whatever happens, God will be glorified in this. That's a relinquishing of the will. That's what you're actually bringing up, Camille. Huh? The human side of us needs to be relinquishing our will. Christians can experience suffering and inner warfare, and Christians can experience inner peace. It's all part of the journey. Here's part number two, the great mystery. Jesus prayed about his suffering in accordance to the will of God. Jesus prayed about his suffering in accordance to the will of God. You know, in some cases, it's only because of suffering 
that some people will be drawn to God. So now you get you get choice, right? No suffering in this world, or relatively no suffering in this world, and live eternally without God, or suffering in this world that draws you to God so that after you die, you live eternity with no suffering. Not a bad exchange, not a bad substitution, 70, 80 plus maybe years of struggle and suffering for eternity with no suffering. Or how about 80 years of comfort and happiness and money for eternity of suffering? So you can see how God uses that. Anyway, Jesus prayed about his suffering in accordance to the will of God. Here's the third one, a great miracle. Jesus said in verse 28, no, what I'm going to pray is glorify your name, Father. That's what I want. And as soon as he said that, a voice from heaven came and said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was around thought it had thundered. Others said that angels had spoken. And then Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Suddenly there's this huge noise voice from heaven. Now, You know that God spoke publicly to Jesus three times. Can you remember where they were? Where was the first time a voice from heaven came from heaven and spoke and the crowd heard it, thought it was thunder? When he was baptised, right? And you notice this, right? God the Son, where was God the Son at the time? In the water. Where was God the Father? In heaven, speaking. Where was God the Holy Spirit? Was he a dove? He was like a dove. He wasn't a dove. The Holy Spirit doesn't have feathers, right? Um, The Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove. There you have the Trinity right there. God the Father in heaven. God the Son in the water. God the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. That's the first time he spoke. When was the second time God spoke to Jesus? The transfiguration. He was up on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. All right, law and the prophets. Moses and Elijah, law and prophets. He was, and God spoke to him. And then the third time here in Jerusalem, God spoke to Jesus. And the voice said, I have glorified it. That is my name. And I will glorify it again. When do, the, the again, when do you think God was at the resurrection, right? I've glorified it now and I'll glorify it again. Jesus was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders and God continued to speak to him. That's amazing. He's... He's he's getting filled up with sin and God speaks to him. The relationship with the father and the son was intimate and unbroken. We see two distinct persons of the Godhead here. At the baptism, we see three persons of the Godhead. Here we see, we hear two distinct persons of the Godhead. God the father and God the son. And why did God speak from heaven? Anybody want to have a guess? Why did for the crowd? And how would that benefit the crowd? How would God speaking from heaven benefit the crowd? Of affirmation of He's the Son of God. Here we have, you, 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 you're talking about who Jesus is. God just spoke from heaven. Interestingly, some commentators, because some people thought it was an angel, some thought it was a clap of thunder. Some commentators say the Jews probably thought it was an angel speaking and the non-Jews thought it was a, a clap of thunder. Who knows? Uh, the point was that God spoke from heaven and he reiterated his total acceptance of Jesus. 
Wow. It also would have been a comfort to the humanity. Yeah. Now watch this one. Jesus was totally suffering at the point, right? Compared to the crucifixion, nothing compared to what he was going through, carrying the sin of the whole world. And God reminded him that he was completely acceptable to God, that the relationship remained intact. Wow. In fact, God may have whispered into Jesus' ear, this suffering that you're going through is exactly what I require from you in order to do this substitutionary atonement. Not only do I love you, but I, this is part of my will for you, which Jesus knew. It's a great miracle. Verse uh, number three here, God the Father and God the Son have always been two distinct persons of the Godhead. God the Father and God the Son have always been two distinct persons of the Godhead. Now, why is that really important? Well, maybe for you, it's not a big deal. But let me tell you that there are many religions way back in the first century that started. We have big names for them and religions today that don't recognise Jesus as a person of the Trinity. He's not part of the Godhead. Right? Um, some people believe that Jesus actually only became God after he resurrected from the dead and all sorts of things. You and I need to understand um, at, at the foundation of our belief, even though you may not have studied it, the church doctrines have taught us that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three persons of the Trinity, one God, three who's. Right? Three persons. One what? Three who's. You need to understand that. And that's the basis for your belief. Jesus didn't become God. He, he, he didn't become God when he was born. No, he's always been God. And we see here that God the Father and God the Son are evidenced in the same place. Really, really important. And then next, quickly, a great prophecy now Jesus says this prophetic word. Now's the time for judgment in the world and the prince of this world will be driven out. When I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all people to myself. John here now adds this parenthetical statement of verse 33. Jesus said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. And then the crowd spoke up. Well, what's this about you being lifted up, which is another metaphor for dying, We've heard that the law from the law that Moses, um, we've, we have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain, remain forever. So how can you say the son's going to be lifted up? Who's the son of man? So Jesus now makes this great prophetic statement. The prince of the world is going to be driven out. I will be lifted up and I will draw all people to me. These three amazing statements. This hadn't happened before now. The prince of the world will be driven out. Who's the prince of the world? Yes. Satan. Up until now, Satan had control over the earth. But now that Jesus had come and substitutionary atonement had, will be taking place in the next couple of days and we can be forgiven of our sins... Satan will receive a deadly blow. He hasn't been vanquished yet. But he's been received a deadly blow. It's like, as we would say in Australia, he's madder than a cut snake. <laughs> a cut snake is really dangerous, right? If you're going to kill a snake, make sure you kill it the first time. Because if it's deadly, which everything in Australia is, and it's cut, it's going to be really angry. And it will lash out. And that's what the devil's doing. Because he's, it's finished. It's done. He's dying. And when will all of that come to conclusion? 
when Jesus returns at the second coming. So what that means is what Jesus is saying here is um, that the prince of the world will be driven out. The devil has been dethroned from his supremacy over human beings. The servant, the, the head of the serpent will be bruised. When the first advent happened, when was that again? The first advent? When was the first advent? At his birth. At his birth. That's why we celebrate advent, right? For four weeks. The first advent was his birth. That bruised the serpent. The second advent, when's that? The second coming, that's when the serpent will be destroyed. Or, well, at least locked up for eternity. You, you referenced um, 1 John 3, 5 about Jesus appeared to take away our sin and in him there is no sin. And just three verses later it says, in 1 John 3, it says, the Son of God appeared for this purpose that he might destroy the works of the devil. Yeah. Fantastic. So, first part of the prophecy, the prince of the world will be driven out. Second part of the prophecy, I'll be lifted up. What does that mean? The cross is going to be lifted up. Crucifixion. They didn't know that yet. Every time Jesus told his disciples he was going to die and rise three days later, they had no idea what he was talking about. He knew he was going to be crucified. Early on in his ministry... When Jesus was talking to the teachers of Israel, he said in John 3.14, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. He already knew that way back then. He was going to be lifted up. This is a prophetic statement. I'm going to be crucified. Which is interesting because in the Roman government, Crucifixion was for the most vilest criminals. And Jesus was crucified because he claimed to be God. (laughs) Most people would be locked up in a mental asylum. Jesus got crucified along with the vilest criminals with a, with a, a death that was reserved for the worst. And yet he knew that. And then finally, he says, I will draw all people to me. Okay, what does that mean? That's that's difficult. I will draw all people to me. Does that mean that everybody's going to get saved? What does that mean? Your turn. What does that phrase mean? I will draw all people to me. At one time, everybody's going to bow before him. It's for everybody. Don't use this verse for the doctrine of universalism, which is a heresy. See here, all people will be drawn to me. That means everyone's going to get saved. No, it does not mean that. And be careful of that. It means that through Jesus, everyone will be able to come to God. Well, the way is open, that there's no barriers. No barriers anymore. Anybody. Jesus will be the means by which any human being can come to God. After the crucifixion, many great numbers of people would turn from the power of Satan and follow Jesus. Many people will become Christians. But it doesn't mean everybody. This is not universalism that everyone will be saved. It means that everyone can have an opportunity to be saved. And then as Carolyn said, once Jesus returns, everybody's going to kneel before him. Now, it doesn't mean that they are going to get saved. It just means that everybody's going to recognise that he's God. Then it'll be too late. People are going to recognise that they made a mistake. Yep. Oops, that's going to be a really bad... He becomes the gate. He becomes the gate now. Yeah, that's right. The gate. He becomes the gate. That's the way you get to God. Except the gate, in this case, 
doesn't have a handle on his side of the gate. The handle is on our side of the gate. You've got to open the gate if you want to go through it. He's not going to open it for you. He put the gate there, but you've got to grab the handle. So, um, in other words, salvation can only be possible through Jesus and the crucifixion. And then all people will be drawn to him. And isn't it lovely to think it's not just for English-speaking Anglicans. Because, you know, there are some religions where you've got to speak the language, right? In Christianity, every human being, it's totally inclusive. Every human being can come. It's totally exclusive. Only through Jesus can you come. It's lovely. Number four. It was the crucifixion of Jesus that would become the means by which humans could know God. By which humans could know God. It was the crucifixion of Jesus that would become the means by which humans could know God. And finally, a great warning. Then Jesus said... Now, this is interesting. Watch this. The crowd in verse 34 said, We've heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who's the Son of Man? They were asking, if you're the Messiah and you're going to be lifted up, you're going to die But we've learned from the Old Testament that the Messiah is going to live forever. Well, how can you be the Messiah if you're going to be lifted up and die? No idea of the resurrection, of course. Now, you're up to you again, verse 35. Does Jesus answer the question of the crowd? Who's the Messiah? How can this happen? Does Jesus answer their question? No, he doesn't, right? They ask about their theology and the Messiah being lifted up and living forever and who's the Messiah. And he answers with a riddle, which he always does when he's with the crowd. You are going to have the light for just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they're going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. When he said this, he finished speaking and he left and hid himself from them. Just quickly, theological point here, the word hid is in the passive tense. means he didn't hide himself, he was hidden from them. They, they, They didn't search for him for a while. After that, he didn't run away. He was not a good translation there. So, Jesus says, you are going to have the light just a little bit longer. Walk while you've got the light because eventually the darkness will overtake you. What's he referring to there? You you help me translate this. He's the light of the world. He's going to be there just for a little while. Anything else? So you've got me. I'm here for a little bit. Pay attention to what you can. Because once I'm gone, you're going to have to do this on your own. And for 40 days till the Holy Spirit comes, uh, 40 days for the um, ascension and then 50 days for the Holy Spirit, there's a couple of months there. You're going to have to do this on your own. So... Make sure you pay attention. If you're walking in the dark, you don't know where you're going. There's a time of great darkness coming. And he's referring both to when he's gone. And you can also use that as an analogy for the after he returns to heaven and the world we have to live in till he comes again. That's a time of great darkness too, right? Till he returns. Jesus would be gone 
from the earth and it'll be more difficult to walk in the light. So here's a lesson for us. This is an application. You walk in the light that you have. People ask me, what about those tribes in Africa that have never heard of Jesus? There's no tribes left in Africa that haven't heard of Jesus. There may be a few in South, Afri South America, in the Congo, maybe. So they will be judged with the light they've been given. But for the rest of the world, and everybody in Canada who's rejected God and totally dismayed, dis dismissed spirituality, many, many Christians... We walk with the light that we've been given and you follow the light. Now watch this. Verse 36 is really, really important for a great warning. Verse 36. Believe in the light while you have the light. Your turn. What does that mean? To believe in the light while you have the light. Too late. What else does it mean to believe in the light? Well, if you're, if we're referring to Jesus as the light, then the context would suggest that it's a belief in Him, because that's right. the issue all along. Right. So believe in Jesus while you have the light. When He's revealed to you, you believe in Jesus, right? While you have the opportunity. While you've got the opportunity. While it's presented to you. I am constantly amazed at how impervious Canadians are to the gospel. Could it mean the light as reflected in the word of God, i.e. the Bible? Yes. That we have still? Yes. Yeah. And the light that's reflected in the word of God is Jesus. Yeah. Right? He is the word. That's one of his names. But watch this. It's really, really important. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you can become children of light. It doesn't say believe in the light and you'll be children of light. It says believe in the light so you can become children of light. Now it's your turn again. How do you become a children of the light? Open your heart, open your life to the Lord, believing. Sally said... <laughs> That's one of Tim's favourite words at the moment. Surrender. You see, he makes a distinction. Believe in the light so you can become a child of the light. You believe in Jesus and then you follow him and you surrender. You give up your will. Not my will, but thy will, as, as Camille said. Jesus praying in the garden, right? You believe in the light. Then you follow him. And as you do that, then you become a child of the light. Really, really important. It's not you believe and you become a child of the light. You believe so that you can become. There is something here that just hit me that when he said that the light is with you for a while and the darkness will come, we live in a very dark time. Yes. And we lament how things are going bad, but the darkness will continue to increase and the light will shine. Yeah. And the more the darkness is, the more the light will be visible. Yeah. And Jesus sort of said a parable, where you have a place where there's light, you can't have darkness. You turn the light on, there's no shadows, if you know what I mean in that metaphor. Sorry? The darker the night, the brighter the light. Yeah, the darker the night, the brighter the light. Fantastic. So um, here's my fourth point. The, um, number five, that word should actually be believing, not believe. Believing. You can correct that. That's a typo. Believing in the light is only part of the process of becoming children of light. You must also walk in the light. Huh? Believing in the light is only part of the process of becoming children of light. You must also walk in the light. Don't just be talking the walk. You've got to be walking the talk. Right? Okay, let's finish. So Jesus having this brief conversation with Greeks, 
and all the other people that are around him. And in a few short words, Jesus reveals these amazing truths to us. That's why this is a great revelation. In these few verses, Jesus, just a few words, he reveals to us these eternal truths that can be easily missed if you just read the text like you're reading a newspaper. And from these and other things, but from here we find some of the most important doctrines, the basic doctrines of the church. (coughs) That Jesus bore our sin so that we don't have to die eternally. That God actually suffered in human form. And that there are two distinct persons in the Godhead, three if we include the Holy Spirit, but in this case, God the Father and God the Son, and they are distinct and separate, and yet one, pers- one God and three persons. And that Jesus prophesied his crucifixion, which fulfilled a whole bunch of other... Welcome. He, he fulfilled a bunch of other prophecies... And finally, Jesus gave a great warning that you and I need to be children of the light. And in order to be a child of the light, you not only believe, you've got to walk in the light. Let me pray for you. Father God, we thank you for these words of Jesus. May they inspire us to continue to walk in the light. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's share the peace. Can I ask you to please stand? And then we'll finish with communion. And I say to you, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Go share that peace with each other. Thank you. Just some quick announcements uh, before we have our communion. Page nine. Remember, we're here every night. We've been here since the 9th of July, every night praying at the church. Uh, Seven o'clock, you can come and join us if you want to. Last night we had a Roman Catholic priest saw the lights on walking down here at Crescent Beach and he came and joined us, Father Patrick. So that was great to have him. Um, So come and join us if you're just here for a few minutes or you can join for the whole time. We're uh, praying from 7 till 8.30 every night. Yes. And then when it's dark, this is the only light for miles, right? It's like a lighthouse. That's why we call it a lighthouse. So, um, Ladies refresh every Tuesday, 10.30 here at the church with Jenny. Obviously no support groups while we have our prayer vigil on. Ed? Yeah, we're hoping to do a, a book signing for the next Sunday. If the books turn up, they should be there on Friday. Right, so Ed and, uh, and somebody else has, uh, Ed and David. Dave Kitts wrote a book called The Elisha Code and hopefully it's published, hopefully it'll arrive. Next Sunday, Ed's going to be preaching a, a healing service and a healing sermon and after the service, we'll have a book signing and you can uh, get one of Ed's books and have it signed and keep it in your library. So that will happen next Sunday, Lord willing, if the books arrive. Yeah, uh, $10 for every book will go to the Oikos project. It'll be $20. Yep. So the books are $1,000, $900. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 20 bucks for the book, 10 bucks will go to Project Oikos. Thank you, Ed. Um, uh, so remember, after the service, we've got a potluck lunch. Now, um, if you're an able-bodied hand today, our normal team are not here today. They're in different places for lots of different reasons. So if you're an able-bodied fellow, after the service, could you come and see me and help me set up the church um, because we need to move some pews and stuff. So uh, if you're available and you can do a little bit of lifting and moving chairs then and setting up tables, come and see me after the service. We need about three or four pairs of hands to do that. Um, so next Sunday, of course, oh, and, and everybody's welcome to stay for lunch, even if you didn't bring anything. There's plenty of food, so come and join us um, for lunch. Next Sunday, Pastor Ed will be preaching. 
It's called the Reign of Christ Sunday. It's the last Sunday of the ecclesiastical year. And then the following week, the first Sunday of Advent, we start the new year, the new ecclesiastical year. And in the new year, 3rd of December, I'm going to be doing four sermons on spiritual disciplines in helping you navigate the world in which you live. The spiritual discipline of finances, the spiritual discipline of prayer, the spiritual discipline of reading scripture, and the spiritual discipline of keeping a Sabbath. So four spiritual disciplines that I'll be teaching on during the season of Advent, because Advent is a penitential season. And so the liturgy will change, we'll have the confession, and uh, we'll have a different prayer for our communion, and we'll be looking at self-reflection and considering ways in which we can continue to grow in our journey. Uh, if you're interested in the mission trip into Malaysia with the Anglican Mission, let me know, 21st of May to the 3rd of June. Immediately after dinner, a lunch today, the choir that has been working with Jenny will be um, rehearsing. Anything else to say, Jenny, about that? No. We're good for that. Yeah, the choir, the choir will uh, rehearse while we clean up, while us strong fellas clean up. And uh, just a quick reminder again last time that the um, church is a fragrance-free church, so please refrain from wearing fragrances. Some people are highly allergic to scents, so let's not, uh, when we gather together, let's not wear scents. And uh, next week I'll tell you about the choir for Joy Lim. Okay, there's much to give thanks to God for. Listen to the offering sentence this week. I thought it was really, really appropriate. It comes from Deuteronomy 16, verse 10. Then celebrate the Feast of Weeks. That's the celebrate the festival, right? To the Lord your God by giving a free will offering in proportion to the blessings the Lord your God has given you. How many... Blessings has God given you? How much should your offering be to God? Well, that's something that you and God can consider. The more blessings that God's given you, the more offerings you can give to Him as a sign of saying, Thank you, God. This is my free will offering to you. So, Three million. beg your pardon? Three million. Three million. Yeah, that'll be good. Let's, let's stand and take up our offering.
Father God, we thank you for these gifts. We pray that you would bless them and multiply them and accept them as our offering to you of love and thanksgiving. We thank you for these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. Okay, time for a quick update on Project Oikos. Don't want to make it long, but just to keep you up so that you can pray. So this last week, I met with two people who uh, each know people or have the ability to make a $2 million donation just like that. Wow. There are people around who have money. And I met with two different um, parties this week and um, we're just praying now. And I've also got some other people that I've spoken to who are going to be reaching out to other people who they know that have money. Um, obviously, we're not going to make the money that we need to pay off our loans by bake sales. That's going to be a lot of cream pie. So we need to be able to donate money. And you've been praying for that. And we now have some people who have actually been thinking about that for us. We have, they haven't sent the money yet, but they've been thinking about it. And the other side of the thing I want you to know now, because we're six weeks out, as the fundraising goes out into the community, pretty well all of the lower mainland knows that we're trying to raise money. It wouldn't be surprising to you for you to know that there have been several developers who have contacted me, who have said to me, you're raising funds for the church, would you be interested in selling the church? To which I said no. But just so that you know, that word is out on the street now. So I want you to keep praying that these, I think we've got at least nine irons in the fire of different levels of connection with people. Some people who ask, been asked, will you help us with a $3 million gift? And the response was, I'll think about it. I'll get back to you. Another response was, the check's in the mail, but it hasn't been in the mail. Another response was, I can't give it to you, but I, I know people who have that money, and I, on your behalf, I will go and talk to them. So as, um, I think it was Sally, did you say we're in the ninth hour? Now, the 11th hour, but it's not the 12th hour. So here's the point, I want you to keep praying, right? That's what's going to change your heart. And um, pray that God will touch somebody's heart who's quite capable of giving the money for $2 million and then we need a million bucks for the renos. But $2 million will pay off the debts. We have to pay our debts back in January, our loans, our friendly loans. We've got to pay them back. So keep praying. And um, this rodeo is not over yet. Um, there's still irons in the fire and... You know, nothing like a good deadline to get finance people to do something about making a donation. So keep praying for us. We're there and um, you'll hear from me when we get the two million bucks. Uh, Let's yes. celebrate the yeah. <laughs> So church family, I say to you, lift up your hearts and let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Loving God, we thank you for this world of wonder and delight. You have given it to us to care for so that all your creatures may enjoy its bounty. Lord our God, we give you thanks and praise. And we thank you that when we turned away from you, you sent Jesus to live and work as one of us and bring us back to you. He showed us how to love you and set us free through an atoning sacrifice to love and serve one another, Lord our God. And so with everyone who believes in you, with all the saints and angels, we rejoice and praise you, saying together as a community, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And now we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine. May we who receive them, as Jesus said, share his body and his blood. On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave you thanks. 
And he broke the bread and he gave it to his friends and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup and he gave you thanks. And he shared the cup with them and said, This is my blood poured out so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. And we respond with this age-old anthem as we say together, Christ, Christ is coming. and Christ is and Christ you said it. We who are many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. And so, Lord, you taught us to hope for salvation, the joy of every longing heart. And so we pray for the coming of your kingdom in the words our Saviour taught us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen and amen. And so I say to you, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brought us home, dying and living. He declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body, live in his good life. We who drink his cup, bring life to others. We who spirit life, give life to the world. Give us in this world so we all are the children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Amen. Well, thank you. We're going to do the blessing. And uh, if you don't know, it's four declarations. The first three, we point to the cross. And the last one, we raise our hands up in hope. So church family, what are you going to do about all your problems? We descend into the Christ. What about all your difficulties? We descend into the Christ. And what are you going to do about the devil's works? We descend into the Christ. Got that right. And what do we do with all our hopes? We descend into the Christ. Amen. Thank you for being here today. Remember, immediately after the service, we'll have lunch together. Please stay for lunch. Um, some of the guys will help. We'll move the pews and we'll set up tables and then we'll have lunch together. And just one quick note about lunch. When we have lunch, we don't, we don't eat or drink in the sanctuary So, because we've only got one room. When we move the pews up, the sanctuary is going to be shortened for a bit. So we'll eat back there, but we don't bring food and drink into the sanctuary part where the pews are, if you don't mind. Okay, so as you go on your way this week, think of the words that Jesus said and these amazing truths and doc doctrines, this substitutionary atonement. He died in your place. It's important doctrine, but it affects the way you live every day. Think about the fact that he found a way for you to be in a relationship with God. So you believe in him and walk in the light. Today, I pray this week, till we meet next week, I pray that everywhere you go, there'll be light and you'll be sharing that light with the people around you. Here's our final blessing. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage and fight the good fight of faith so that you may finish your course with joy. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest on you and those you love now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing.
love and serve the Lord. Praise be to God.